There is more fresh snow in the mountains tonight. It was coming down on I-70 near Loveland Pass earlier today, and heavy snow will be falling south of I-70 overnight. Around the metro area, cool, cloudy day with rain on the way this weekend. Let's bring in Lauren Robinson for a look ahead at that. Hey, Lauren. Well, that's right. Some areas got a few raindrops across the front range today, but the heaviest stuff certainly falling south of the I-70 corridor. You can see that here on our HD Doppler radar. We have some light snow showers just west of the urban corridor into the foothills and high country here. We've seen a couple of raindrops across the front range. Denver has stayed mostly dry, but by far the heaviest precipitation will be south in central and southern portions of the high country, as well as southern portions of the front range, Colorado Springs all the way down to the south Trinidad. So we're going to continue to watch for that as we go into the overnight hours with that heavy snow. We do have several areas of winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings. Some areas were upgraded to winter storm warnings and the winter weather advisory even includes southern front range foothills areas. So we're going to watch for these winter weather alerts to be in effect through the middle of the day tomorrow. Coming up in my seven day forecast, we're going to talk about this heavy mountain snow overnight. We're also going to talk about scattered rain showers tomorrow and Mother's Day weekend storm chances. All of that. For a Denver police officer is OK after crashing their patrol car into a tree tonight. This happened just before 630 at 16th and Gilpin, a block north of Colfax. The officer was going to a call, lights and sirens on, when another car hit the police cruiser. Cruiser hit the tree. No one was hurt. Denver Public Schools let parents know in an email that their principal would not be returning. No explanation as to why. Nine News Investigates reviewed the documents that show this principal had accused the district of discriminating against her. Here's Nine News reporter Rhea Jha. Here at Hallett Academy, where learning begins, our growth, it's green. It's green, folks. This is Dominique Jefferson, back when she was principal of Hallett Academy in August. After seven years in charge, her school had earned the state's highest performance rating for the first time in her tenure. Congratulations. We did it. Ah, I wanted to also share that on Friday, I'm passing out green cupcakes. And if you want to send your child on Friday wearing green, why don't we do that too? And she did hand out those cupcakes, wearing a black tutu to celebrate the day. Two weeks later, she was gone. Out of nowhere, um, we got an email saying that our principal was on leave. They wouldn't say why, they wouldn't say if it was medical, they wouldn't say if it was a personnel issue, but just that she was gonna be gone. Jessica Lawson and uh, Ashley Wedgworth both have kids who go to Hallett. The only communication they received about Principal Jefferson's departure came from these two emails. Fast forward, that turned into this spring. She's been gone the entire, almost the entire school year. We have not received any communication. Zero communication for an entire school year. Parents, teachers, and students have been wondering what happened to their principal. We asked for public records from DPS and other agencies, and all those requests were denied. But we still got records, including emails and formal discrimination complaints through sources, giving us the first context into what led up to Principal Jefferson's departure. On September 18th, DPS sent out the first email announcing Hallett Principal Dominique Jefferson is currently on leave. In a formal discrimination complaint, Jefferson said she was suspended in retaliation. This complaint says she started experiencing discrimination and harassment from DPS staff in February of last year, but it doesn't say what exactly happened. Emails show this was one of seven formal discrimination complaints she filed last year. During that time, Jefferson kept emailing with DPS looking for updates on her investigation. For months, her questions went unanswered. It was just waiting and waiting and rumors and no answers and waiting. And then six months later, out of the blue again, right before spring break. Jefferson's name appeared on the school board's March 7th meeting. For the purpose of discussions regarding personnel matters to discuss Dominique Jefferson. That discussion would be kept from the public. That we move into executive session at the next meeting on March 21st, uh, the Manila folders that you are about to receive. Superintendent Alex Marrero presented a confidential teacher dismissal recommendation. The day after that, parents received the only other email from DPS, which said Principal Dominique Jefferson will not be returning as principal of Hallett Academy. Even if they were to place a new principal here, they'd be doing so without the support of the community and without giving us the answers that I think we deserve. In DPS, 14% of students are black. 
At Hallett, it's 71 percent. Some parents say they chose Hallett because Jefferson was in charge. The reason, you know, we love Hallett and I brought my students to Hallett is because of Miss Jefferson. Um, and also because they have teachers and a principal and are around other students that look like them. My kids ask all the time. They'll come home after hard days and say, I wish Miss Jefferson was there. DPS told Nine News they won't discuss her situation, citing employee privacy laws. That silence has left parents and teachers struggling to explain to her students what happened to Principal Jefferson. Miss Jefferson, we want you to come back. We reached out to Jefferson and she said she would not speak to us, but DPS has until May 27th to name Jefferson's replacement. Parents and teachers are circulating a petition to stop the search for a new principal. It has hundreds of signatures now. In the studio, Rhea Ja, 9 News. Protesters on the Auraria campus tonight spent hours blocking the intersection at Colfax and Osage. Now they're back at the encampment on Tivoli Quad. The Auraria campus released a statement late tonight saying this was, quote, escalating tensions of the encampment situation. They also said they called in Denver police for help. Earlier today, the campus said the protest camp has become a hazmat situation. Human waste on and around the quad has been observed as a result of poorly maintained temporary bathroom facilities that the protesters have illegally placed on the quad. Uh, we've received uh, Complaints from parents and students to campus administrators with pictures of feces near and around their vehicles parked near the quad. Auraria says hazmat crews from the state's health department came to remove some of that waste. They have also say they believe more than half of the protesters are not students from that campus. Protesters also started a new encampment today, this time on DU's campus. They started gathering on Carnegie Green near DU's administrative building around 11 this morning. The protesters have several demands, things we've heard before, including that the university divest from companies supporting Israel. The university says they've put up fences and tables in the middle of the grass to create a space for dialogue. I think there could be some healthy dialogue here. There could be some good conversations because I think especially in the Jewish community, we we want to come together to have a conversation. Uh, there we're very involved in, in this conversation in particular for many decades. Late today, DU issued an interim protest policy. They said the encampment can stay, but only with protesters who are part of the DU community. The university says it has the right to remove anyone else without notice. Nearly two years after the right to an abortion in the U.S. was overturned, abortion advocates in Colorado say the demand for that care here continues to increase. The Cobalt Abortion Fund helps cover the cost of the procedure or travel costs for pregnant people. In the first three months of the year, they spent more than half a million dollars. That's more than they spent in all of 2021. Cobalt says 85 percent of the clients getting support for travel come from Texas. You know, what these numbers reflect is that domino effect. As folks um, need or forced to travel outside of their state to access abortion care, they're pushed further into their pregnancy. And so their procedure fees might go up. They're forced to travel, um, which increases complications in accessing that abortion care. They may have multiple layovers. They may have to stay a night in a different town, meaning that they have to get a hotel. They have to figure out child care expenses. Based off spending so far this year, COBOL is projecting it'll put out about $2.3 million in 2024. That is nearly double what they spent last year. A school district in northern Colorado has a new way to get more mental health support into schools. Interns. Nine News reporter Rachel Krause shows us a new program to reach more kids and train the next generation of social workers. Tanner, kick us off. At Rocky Mountain High School, class is in session. This is, stress, this is stressful, like, sometimes, but, like, this group makes it go away. Students here working on social-emotional learning. You can be real with me. Like, you can talk with me the same way that you would talk to your brother or something. You get to decide how you want to impact people every day. This is the new men's group created by one of the school's mental health interns, Blake McLaughlin. Just really seeing students be themselves and just seeing them show up in a way that's so socially supportive of one another. Blake is one of the 10 mental health specialist interns placed at schools around the Poudre District, thanks to a $9.7 million federal grant for school mental health support. School social worker Trisha Van Horsen says these interns are already making an impact. I think it's been a change and it's also we've been able to see where the needs are and really being able to plug them in to really where 
we don't have the staff to do it or that it's a need that we're not able to meet. And so having just additional staffing has been amazing because I was like this, this men's group wouldn't be happening. Our student interns have been incredibly impactful. They're amazing. Our, our students feel extremely connected to them. Liz Davis with Pooter School says these interns are reaching more students and digging deeper into these mental health issues. Post-COVID, our students uh, really struggled with anxiety and some of their mental health needs and some of our staffing ratios are not meeting some of the national averages for mental health providers. So they're really helping us bridge that gap so students have access to more mental health providers and get more support. It just says a lot about each of you that you have shown up for each other like this. Blake says he's proud of the work he's seeing from his students every day. I'm pretty lucky. And ready for the growth that's still to come. So I'm excited to finish out this school year with, with you guys and whatever is in store for next year. The interns are graduate students at CSU. They'll graduate in just a few days, then spend the next two years with the school as fellows. Ten more students will join them in the fall, and Pooter Schools will keep growing the number of interns over the next four years. The district hopes this can serve as a model for how other districts can use mental health funding to better serve students. Rachel Krause, 9 News.